Hello, hello, folks. So let's get started. And I want to make sure that I give you the way of the land here. We're going to talk about the teams. What are agile teams? Why do we have teams? What does it look like when they are performing? And ideally, myth busting here, because I feel like sometimes there, there are too many things that people say that uh, um, pragmatically, you know, in the field, they are just not true. So teams, what are they? I always, always love to deconstruct. So every time we start um, anything, I go from the very beginning, let's go from the word and, and build from the ground up. I just feel that's such a, such a way of slowly getting there, even though I, I talk fast. But what I'm showing here is a teams. It's a group of people who trust each other, aligned around and collectively committed to a clear goal. And I, I feel that this one kind of like a, gives it all entire. Like once you get that, you, you understand the fundamentals. So from here, no clear goals. You don't have a team. It's that harsh. There is no commitment. Then you still don't have a team. No trust, no team. You can have people working together in many different capacities, but the impact of, of understanding that concept of teams and the way I'm saying here, and this is, you know, I know some people agree with this definition, but this is a very um, personal definition that I'm giving you based on my experience. The impact of this is that you just can't put people in a room and call that a team, uh, not that if you want them at some point reach a certain level of what we call performance, you know, they, they really, which means like they really know how to play together. They know how to, they know their strength, their weakness, how to self-adjust to each other. It's just, you know, a bunch of people put together that do not have that kind of like connection. They might be awesome and they might be like super senior in what they do, but, but you know, they might just try like remove trust from there and they just try to outshine each other, for example. So these things are important pieces when you're considering um, a team. If I don't trust you, I won't share information. That is, that is so key. If I don't understand the goal from an aligned perspective, with you, I think it's one thing, you think it's another, I'll go with my guts. <laughs> so those are the things that, you know, if I don't trust you, how how can I know that you're gonna pull in your weight? So I'm not pulling your weight. So the trust piece here, we're gonna see, it is really key. That's why uh, I really, uh, really highlighted it. I will say though, that uh, this thing that we call working group, they do exist. People that, that can hand off work to each other and, you know, there's more individual accountability, but that's not what we are talking about here. We're really talking about this modality of teams. Why teams? Why would you then make a choice? What does that enable for you? And this is my personal favorite. There's a, you know, lists like those in the internet, you can find plenty, but I wanted to, to do a, a less obvious, I think, list of, um, of what teams really bring. The first one is like I was saying, work groups, they can be really effective, but they depend on um, individual commitment. So I hand off work to you. And with teams, we can have collectively accountability, which means I don't need to be 100% sure. <laughs> And you don't need to be 100% sure. We just need to trust each other, which means that our per percentage just kind of average a little bit. That's really important. And I think it's one of the most um, underestimated pieces. We know we can combine our strength and then rise to the occasion. That is pretty powerful. That is beyond having just the technical knowledge for doing things. Um, so we, this, is, this is something I really appreciate when we can work with teams. So better problem solving is, I think it's one that... Um, People like to use the name innovation and innovation is one of the ways to better, uh, uh, you know, show problem solving, but it's sometimes even the, the simple things of the day to day. It's taking in multiple perspectives. Um, you know, if you, it's the good two heads think better than one kind of thing. So we have more creativity, better solutions in the room. Mm -hmm. Then we have faster learning. It's kind of like linked to the one above here. It's kind of linked but different. Because we trust each other, we will be challenging our assumptions without any fear. Because I know you're not challenging me. You're challenging my ideas. You're not trying to win. We are trying to have the best idea put forward. This is really powerful. And this will always be that awesome, amazing developer thinking alone in the corner. And I say that has <laughs> having been before a developer thinking alone in the corner and I'm thinking I'm so great, uh, but no, you know, like a, there's a, there's a lot of things to be learned even from simple things. Like when the test 
that fails the build. It's not about the fact that I broke the build. It's about like, what did that test tell us about our pipeline, about the code? It's a completely different way of, of considering results. Then I'm not sure if you heard people saying that teams actually help you with risk taking. And it's because you can hedge. I'm not sure if you're familiar with the concept of hedging. If you invest, you probably know that, but it's kind of like averaging things. It's, I don't win alone, but I also don't fail alone. And it, once again, it's a part of like, you, you know something, you assume something, and in the end, we can always trust that we can work together. So it does enable us to take a few bolder risks and make you know bigger assumptions and go for the kill. It's something that only teams in the construction that, that we said, you know, trusting each other, aligning goals, it's, the, it's something that they will bring. And I have to mention this one, awesomeness and sense of belonging. Uh, I'm a, a lot about human beings, but I will say this one is actually just about good business. What do I mean by that? Sense of pride in being part of something bigger than you uh, and not being alone, it's something that really brings higher satisfaction at work, right? So there are a few, a couple of studies showing that um, winning as a team is stronger because of that. Not only we share the happiness, but we share the struggle. It's extremely bonding for, for human beings because it becomes an experience that we went through together. Now it's all very fine and dandy, but it shows that you can have something like more than 50% of increasing job performance, which means my productivity, the quality of my work is more than half percent, you know, halfway better and 50% of decrease in the risk of turnover, 50% of risk of not losing your people. That is really, really big, especially if you consider industries like IT, where people just keep rotating from company to company. And I think the most impressive one, I don't remember the figures. It was um, an HBR study. If you don't have HBR, I recommend, even if you use the free version of Harvard Business Review, it's amazing for you to, to gain some more business uh, acumen. And they were saying, I think, it was past 70% of the risk of sick days. It's just good for mental health, good for bodily health that people um, have the sense of belonging. So that's what teams bring. Teams are awesome for profit. They are absolutely awesome for your business. Okay, now how do we know if they are really pulling in? Like this is, this is the best team they're really performing. Is there a way of recognizing that? I will share with you my personal favorites. And I will start with, uh, you know, this one is, is not super, I guess, like a, it's not sexy, but it needs to be said. A team that does not achieve goals together, like, you know, goals, goals, achieving goals. This is really <laughs> why you put a team there together. Performance really is about hitting the mark. There is, there is, you know, this is one, it's not the only thing, but come on, it's about, Bullseye. That's really what you mean as performance increases. You do expect people to know more, to say, I can't do that in five days, but I can do it in seven. You expect that kind of thing happen with your team because that team understand how to work together. They understand their capacity. They commit to something that they are able to, and they know how to extrapolate, to be bold and to look at things like never done that before, but based on something we know, and, you know, that's uh, that's really how they go. What you see many times is that we, we throw people together in organization and just say, you know, we don't give the, the, the prerequisites that I showed before and just say, now you're a team. Then you're going to see a lot of those things like, um, well, we didn't deliver this time, but we have the next sprint. It's, it's debatable how, how fun that is really as a way of uh, performing as a team. Then you notice healthy conflicts. I hope you do notice that that is a great sign of, of maturing and achieving performance because it's not all quiet when teams perform. They will disagree. Uh, and the team that is always smiling, that is called groupthink. That is an awful thing. Hopefully that's not happening to your team. It's not the same. Disagreeing is really great. Uh, it's desirable. It shows um, the diversity of thought and enough psychological safety for people to actually express themselves. And it's in how they speak, it, it, it shows respect, right? They, they, they will pick a way in expressing their differences that is extremely graceful, that is extremely respectful. Again, it's about the ideas, not about measuring if you are better than me. So the best idea win, not you win and I lose. 
So conflict, if, if conflict are a way to grow and your team is showing that, they are really on their path to performance. And there is positivity. Let us mention here that positivity is important. It's not just about delivering, delivering, uh, and, and that's it. That's not necessarily a team that performs, although that is a team that gives results. But a positive team is a team on their way to performance. They like to work with each other. It's not just respect. They really like what they work with, be it the technology or the problems that they are solving. They really are invested. If you're just achieving goals, achieving goals, but you're not really, there's nothing, there's no happiness. I mean, this is not sustainable and sustainable pace is one of the agile principles, one of my favorite, very forgotten, and so is motivated individuals. So all in the positivity is in there. And then there is a minimum process. And that is not really something simple and, uh, and it, will, it will look different for different teams. So what I mean by that is that they remove the inessential. When you work with your teams, start with where they are now. I think that's the, the, the key uh, thing that I've, I've come to learn. Then you'll slowly improve the process by simplifying it. So until it will contain only the essentials. So you can't really transpose someone else's process and boom, here is for my team because they didn't do the work of removing the pieces. If they started with the original process that that other team had, they would have probably remove different things and adapt it differently. So you can't copy and paste team process. It's great to share the news. Hey, look at what's working for us. This is our process. But don't assume you can just copy it. And we see a lot in organizations when they try to make the team process too uniform, that just doesn't work. You have to have a few um, a few contracts among teams, but then inside the team, it's, it's very unique. Um, and then the famous one, collaboration and collaboration. You can't teach the stuff. Absolutely not. You can foster it, but you can really teach. And so, you know, it's a, it absolutely can't impose definitely not imposing. So then you have the lateral leadership. And that's one's a favorite of mine. And sometimes I call it um, horizontal leadership. So just get the idea to the sides. And um, I wonder if you heard of those names before. I know there's this uh, amazing uh, coach, Samantha Slade, and she talks about horizontal leadership. I think she coined the, the term a lot. It's about leading depending on the situation. So within the team and the team members, whenever the situation calls for, hey, uh, I, I know better in this one. Uh, here's how we could be doing. And everybody accepts that momentary leadership. And, uh, it, you know, it's just the, the one who is more prepared, just take the lead at that time. And nobody is really stressed and nobody feels robbed of anything. This is Those are things that I, I am sure you, once you have those, you can for sure know that your team is on performance. But on your way to performance, I like you to consider um, that things are always a gradient and, and think of a scale, one to 10, if you will. And 10 is like, yeah, super awesome. One is the opposite. So maybe the team's like level two in achieving goals, level five in positivity, before you try to make everything higher, maybe try and calibrate things. And that's why I'm giving you the truck here, the, the six wheeler, because I gave you six parameters to calibrate. This, this is a powerful machine, can carry a lot of weight and go fast, right? But if the wheels are misaligned, you're missing air, right? So this, this not only won't go fast, it can be dangerous. So you really, you're better off with a team that's scoring five on everything than being completely, you know, we're going to see in the end what happens when we start being too unequal in trying to achieve performance. I think everybody has an opinion about Agile. And Agile now is outside of the scope of only software development. But it did start in the realm of software development. And it's funny to see a lot of in-success in software development these days trying to use Agile. And I, I hear a lot of the stuff that I'm going to show you here, and that's why I'm calling them um, myth busting. I stuck to the least obvious that I find least obvious because I want to give you a ton of value. You already know the usual suspects. So the first myth is nope, they don't need a Scrum Master. Teams actually don't need any of us. They don't. They could use us. That's really the difference. In particular for the Scrum Master, I want to say, because there is like this, um, you know, Scrum everywhere uh, thing, but 
just know this, um, they don't need a Scrum Master because sometimes they're just not using Scrum. So it's important to keep that in mind so that you don't show up with everything that you know and used with Scrum before. I did that, so I can say <laughs> they can speak very plainly. But also I wrote a blog post recently about that one. So if you're interested, all things agile slash dot ca slash blog and you're going to see the one it was like the the latest ones or what i talked about agile um, scrum master jobs are alive these days basically what happens is that everybody says like i have a problem to solve so i need a scrum master so there you go happy with your scrum knowledge and your scrum heart and you arrive at a place where wow this is not Scrum. I don't even know what's going on here. I don't know why they hired me. So, you know, many times they are not asking you for your Scrum knowledge. They barely know what they need you for. So you actually have to find how you can help. That's, that's just something to keep in mind. So many high-performing teams will not be needing you as a Scrum master. They might also not be needing you as a coach not forever anyway. This is not a career buster. It's just a myth buster that many teams getting formed everywhere. And it's not just software developers, it's also teams of managers, teams of directors. So teams are everywhere. We are not lacking jobs, but it's important to understand and act on the perspective that we are enablers and hunters. We come in and we boost and we amplify and we pump. And there's a moment where it's really good for us to take a step back, either move to another team uh, or like I do, I consult a lot. So I, I many times actually move to a completely different client. And sometimes I come back to another client, uh, you know, they are in a different moment in their journey. So just, just keep that in mind that it's not a matter of needing, it's a matter of wanting and of you bringing value. And that is beyond of the role that you might be occupying, that you might very well be the team manager and you don't have the name Agile Coach, the name Scrum Master, and you are the number one responsible for amping up the performance of your team. This one I find important to mention. I've seen this time and time again and um, put a bunch of people in the senior team and good luck in making this a dream team. So it's not because you have a bunch of stars that you're going to make a star team. We see that in, you know, in, in sports, which is that you can find examples of that everywhere. But I've noticed in particular in the realm of things like software development, what you're going to get is a bunch of egos, a battle of egos going on for quite some time. And conversely, if you put a bunch of junior people together, they love each other, but they really don't know the technology very much yet. You get a great vibe, but they can't really, um, you know, one day they're going to grow into a great team, but right now they can't achieve many results. And we just said that results is what make you know, it's one of the things that makes the team high performing. What I'm going to say sounds plain, but I'm a firm believer for you need a ton of diversity. That's a fact. It's going to be on age, on culture, on background, on seniority. Go for diversity. I'm, you know, I'm 100% sold on that from, from what I've experienced. And I would say you can start with a bunch of average people because, like I said, speaking plainly, it's how they're going to grow together meshing well. It has nothing to do with, you know, you can bring a lot of knowledge, but then you can't really connect with your peers. I don't think you're going to be a great contributor. So this is something really important if you're ever in the position of helping teams getting established. So something to keep in mind here. They don't need to be collocated. And I can say that knowing that the, you know, the open source community exists for, I don't know, 30 years already, you know, even much before we had normal internet and agile. So we know that teams can actually produce amazing work even when they are not co-located. Agile teams can be remote, hybrid, co-located. I will honestly say, I don't think there is one better than the other. I think there are contexts that are more helpful in one case or another. But for example, it is super easy to exchange in person, right? You have a board and you just write things together, look into each other's eye. Of course, that's amazing. However, when I need focus time and we are in the same office and you're just talking to me all the time, boy, I can't focus. I personally cannot. There is nothing like the beauty of putting everything and do not disturb. And I have my two hours of focus and now I'm good to go and I can produce something. I it just, I wonder, you know, what kind of experiences people have when they say things like agile teams have to be co-located. That's not one of the things that I've learned much before of the pandemic. Half of my career had been with distributed teams. And I would say most companies that decide to to favor too much of collocation, they they should actually go for what's called remote first, 
which means as soon as you decide that you're hiring people that are not in the office with you, you have to, it sounds unfair, but you have to make the effort. Everybody puts the phones, the, the headphones, and connects via whatever they connect, because otherwise what you have is information inequality. Countless times, because I, I've always worked in more remote places, I don't know, or lived in more remote places, and then I worked and I was the one not understanding anything that's happening because people are collocated in the room with the horrible acoustics and they, you know, the, the microphone on the desk is just awful. Um, I'm wasting my time in that meeting. I'm not being productive. I'm not contributing. And I, you know, I question my sense of belonging here. So this whole discussion on co-location, I think it needs to be really discussed. And there is a guy on LinkedIn that's doing, I think his hashtag is async agile. So look for that. If there's something that really interests you, he's been writing amazing stuff. He has a whole blog on that. I think he's someone worth following. Um, I love his ideas and, you know, I, I definitely share that. So just something to keep in mind. In the context of co-location. That's a great concept, but no, you don't need T-shaped people. Your team can have people with specialties and your team can still be super high performing. T-shaping is a very positive approach, but not everybody likes that. Not everybody wants to be T-shaped and you can't impose this modality because it has to do with how people want to drive their careers. So I find it a little bit weird when we say, you know, you can't be in this great agile team because you're not but it doesn't really, really work like that. I also have a blog post on that if you if you go and search that. What you need is actually cross-functionality, which means as a team, we have everything that we need inside here. We don't need to ask for anybody else. But that doesn't mean that everybody knows everything. There is one guy taking care of the database of everybody shares a little bit. Absolutely worked. We are cross-functional. We use different mechanisms to, to, to manage the work when we have specialized people versus uh, more generalized people. And it's totally normal. And I've seen awesome teams uh, that really just operate in that way. And that this one is causing quite a conundrum these days on LinkedIn as well. I have to spend less time there. Actually, it's just like I catch a wind of these things because I don't spend a lot of time in, in social media. But I saw like, I think everybody was speaking about this last week. And self-organization, it has nothing to do with boss or no boss. I would say the best self-organized teams, actually, they do recognize their managers, their bosses, their stakeholders as part of the whole thing. Those are fantastic teams that, you know, that you really see grow when producing a lot of value. When you self-organize, you, in order, in fact, to self-organize, you need very clear boundaries. Your boss, when they are awesome and they really mesh well with you, they give you very clear boundaries. And then you can organize as a team and do whatever you want inside of that sandbox very safely because the rules are clear. And of course, eventually expand that. Self-organized teams live in absolutely great harmony with their managers and stakeholders. Well, I really do hope that you got a ton of value and uh, we'll definitely see you on, um, on, on the next one. Bye for now.